Welcome everyone and good morning or good evening to all of you. My name is Allison Van Dyke and I'm the executive director of the Temple of Understanding, which is a 62 year old interfaith organization whose mission is to advocate for interfaith values in the secular setting of the United Nations and as an NGO around the world. Our focus for the past 11 years has been to increase the awareness of religious leaders and actors of our climate crisis and its negative impact on achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. In particular, for us, that means peace, justice, women's health and safety, food sovereignty, and environmental activism. Today, we have three wonderful young activists from interna an international perspective our title is Action Now, Climate Youth Activism. Our first speaker, one of our speakers is Nisa Beck. She is a climate activist and founder of Project Mulan, a youth-led project that aims to spread the UN Development Program's Sustainable Development Goals in Libya. She recently represented her country's Connect for Climate's Youth Driving Ambition at the 2021 Pre-COP26 in Milan. She's also the national leader of Let's Do It and Fridays for Future in Libya. Our next speaker is Ahmed Ihash Taib. He is General Secretary of the Youth for Climate Tunisia Movement and is also Youth Ambassador with the International Movement, Break Free from Plastic. He's 23 years old, and an environmental science major and is the youngest Tunisian to participate in COP26 as part of the official delegation. He was recently named one of the 10 African youth climate activists that are changing the face of our planet. And our third speaker, Mitzi Janelle Tan, is a full-time climate justice activist based in the Philippines in Metro Manila, Lila. She is the international spokesperson and convener for Youth Advocates for Climate Action Philippines, or YACAP, and Fridays for Future of the Philippines, and is an organizer with Fridays for Future International. In particular, she works with Fridays for Future with most, the most affected peoples and areas, making sure that the voices from the global south are heard, amplified, and given space. Welcome to each one of you. You now have the floor. Thank you so much, Jalison, and thank the Temple of Understanding for inviting us to this amazing uh, webinar, let's say. I'm really happy to be with you guys, especially Mitzi, Nisa. They are doing a great job, and you guys uh, like trying to, uh, to just uh, let our voice be heard and let us connect it to more youth and more people that are interested in the climate uh, change crisis. So uh, as you said, we're here just to, to speak, we're here to, to talk and we're here to, uh, let's say, raise awareness about this global issue, which is called climate change. And it is classified among like, I believe, top one crisis that our world is facing right now. I'm so happy to be with you and uh, we're going to have a fruitful conversation today with some uh, amazing questions. I would like to start by asking uh, Nice after that, Mitzi, and I'll be answering myself the same questions. Uh, we came from different cultures, different uh, religions, and uh, we have the same cause that unites unite us, you know. Uh, but we would like to discover more what what. Nisa, what are your guiding spiritual or religious principle that motivates your climate focused work? I mean, definitely you have a religious background. We would like to know like how it contributes to motivate your climate work. You have, you have the floor, Nisa. Thank you, Ahmed, uh, for this introduction. Well, uh, regarding the question, I must, uh, I must say that these 
spiritual uh, or the spiritual awakening is something that I had quite recently, regardless of the fact that I actually grew up in a religious community. Uh, I'm, I'm, I come from a Muslim background. Um, and to be completely honest, I've always known that there were some religious scriptures that focus on like some aspects of the environment, but I'm guilty just as everybody else. I always overlook them because imams and religious leaders, sometimes they prefer to discuss some parts of the Quran and hadiths of the Prophet Muhammad more than others. So I've never really thought about religion, any religion, as like something that's drive is a driving force, for example, towards achieving climate justice. Never, not even once. I honestly overlooked it for the longest times. So it wasn't until recently when Greenpeace Mina started the, this initiative called Umma for Earth. And Umma for Earth was bringing to light something called eco-Islam, which I was not aware of earlier. So I started doing a little bit of research about that. And I realized that the Islamic Foundation of Ecology actually uh, put together a declaration in 2014 about like how Muslims or in people in states that are predominantly Muslim should be working towards climate justice. And they were using scriptures from the Quran and from Prophet Muhammad Hadith. And then another declaration, the Mecca declaration followed a few years later. So I actually studied those, although I'm not usually interested in religious um, uh, declarations coming from religious leaders, et cetera. So I started reading into it and doing my own research and I was surprised by how much the Quran mentioned the environment and climate explicitly dozens of times. And I thought, how, how was that overlooked? Especially that when you talk about the climate issue, most of the doubts come from religious communities or from people who claim to be religious. So that was very interesting for me. So for the first time in my life, I felt more connected to Islam and more connected to Quran because I found an aspect of it that I really like. And I felt that it, it's very natural because, you know, although I'm not, um, I am a practicing Muslim, but uh, uh, you know, sometimes I think about it as something that kind of shapes my identity. And for the first time now, climate, the climate crisis or my work towards climate, it's not just something I'm interested in and it's no longer just a personal belief, but it suddenly became part of my identity. So it wasn't until recently when I realized that actually Islam could be a driving force towards achieving climate justice. And now I'm more interested in that. And I'm working on a project that's explicitly uh, using eco-Islam in Libya. I hope that it will see the light very soon. Thank you, Nisa. I would like to ask you like about, I know I know a few things about the project, but I know it's really interesting because uh, I've been in contact with Greenpeace Mena and they told me great things about the project. So could you tell us like a bit about, uh, a bit more, could you elaborate a bit more about the uh, uh, Umma for Earth project that is, uh, that is like, will be, uh, I guess, seeing the light. So okay, so Umma for Earth, of course, is the green, uh, uh, it's Greenpeace Mina initiative. Uh, and it happened that they contacted few, uh, you know, uh, uh, climate activists from the region to see if they would be interested in taking part in this truth or dare uh, challenge that they did during Ramadan. So it's a platform, it's an independent platform. It does work and function under Greenpeace Mina. And what they do is that they have uh, different activities. One of them is green mosques, for example, where they uh, you know, work with like mosques, and see how they can transition to a more of a green energy or renewable energy sources, et cetera. The second one is being in touch with imams because Friday prayers is a very important uh, thing for Muslims. So every Friday, an imam would give a very long speech for a couple of hours. Those speeches are filled with, you know, um, uh, it helps people to see what are the moral issues that the community is facing, etc., and how can we combat them, and what is their duty as Muslim to do uh, regarding these issues. So uh, there's this 1,000 green speech campaign where they help imams create a green speech 
and give it during Friday prayers. This way they can reach as many people as possible. So this is a very nice initiative and it is the initiative that I wish that I could bring to, to Libya. And then of course you have uh, more uh, virtual engagement with Muslims, not just in Arab countries, uh, because Green Mina, uh, Greenpeace Mina has been also connecting with other uh, Muslim communities in Indonesia and non-Arab uh, states. So they did this truth or dare where they have uh, Islamic friendly challenges that people could take on during Ramadan and share with each other as a way to spread awareness regarding the, the climate crisis. So it's very interesting. I do uh, advise people to look it up. Uh, I really like it a lot, even like I said, as someone who's not uh, the most religious person, it, it helps a lot in spreading awareness. Thank you so much, Lisa. Definitely such initiatives are needed and are essential in our communities, especially in a country like Libya or Tunisia and the Middle East and North Africa. And uh, it's going to help a lot, I believe. Thank you for, for, for telling more about it. So, Mitzi, we would, try, we would like to welcome you again. And uh, same question, like what are your guiding spiritual or religious principle that motivates your climate-focused work? We would like to know more about it, about the background, how everything started with you spiritually or, or in terms of religion. You have, you have the, the... For me, it all started really like the activism because I grew up seeing the climate crisis that I feel like all of us in the panel did. But it was in 2017, I had this one conversation with an indigenous leader, and he told us about how they were being harassed and displaced and militarized and even killed, um, making the Philippines one of the most dangerous places in the world for environmental defenders and activists. And after telling us all about this, the militarization, the killings, he shrugged and said, that's why we have no choice but to fight back. And that was my kind of awakening when I realized that he's right. We have no choice but to fight back. That was the year that I was really experiencing a lot more of what was actually happening in the Philippines because growing up, I grew up um, Catholic and something that was always taught to us was how we should be with the people and the masses, but it's not necessarily something that practicing Catholics actually do or you know, on a normal basis. Um, but that was the year that I got into activism. I was with a lot of workers, picket lines, with a lot of small farmers and small fish folk and indigenous peoples. And being with the masses, I think, being with the people who are most marginalized, that is what really awakened me. And there's this quote, um, it's a Filipino poem, but I'm going to try to translate it. And it translates to awakened, the masses are Messiah. And it is the people who are changing the world. It is the people, like not like individual people, but the people as a collective um, that I have so much hope and faith in that I think my spirituality really stems from that. Thank you so much, Mitzi. Thank you so much for, saying, for telling us about it. It's, it's really amazing. Like uh, for me, I, I came like from, I believe the same background of Anissa, like her neighbors countries. I'm from Tunisia, she's from Libya. So I grew up in a Muslim family, Muslim community. Uh, to be honest, yeah, Islam like is a religion that always motivates you to take care of the animals, uh, don't use a lot of food, don't use a lot of water, be good to nature, respect nature, uh, respect especially trees. We have like many, many, many details about them in Quran and everything, and that definitely motivate, motivated me when I was a kid to, uh, to respect nature and respect the ecosystems and all of these things. But um, let me tell you the truth, like I, uh, I, my, my true awakening and let me say the true link between me like, uh, and climate change and this, 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 uh, this crisis started with uh, Sir David the Timbra. Like I, I believe I watched Planet Earth when I was a kid and I was fascinated about the ecosystems, the animals, about uh, about nature, about the connection between all the elements of nature. And uh, I loved it so much. So everything started with animals. I loved animals and I was really sad when I see like, I don't know, documentaries when they are killing animals and when they are doing like uh, over, over hunting and, uh, and all of these things. And I said, 
I believe animals deserve a better, a better living. They have rights like us. They have the right to live in this planet. And all the violations that we are doing today, it just, it just ridiculous. Like I couldn't like handle it. And uh, and after that, like I started reading about nature and everything, and my connection just got stronger and stronger and stronger to nature and climate. And and I'm I'm talking here. I'm talking about nature, not climate change. I'm just was uh, a person who adores and admires nature and after that I was seeing like when I grew up a bit maybe I was in high school I started knowing how people in different continents are suffering from water pollution water scarcity from the different like climate change impacts and I was I don't know I had like this something that united us all which is called humanity I couldn't just uh, get I couldn't just accept the fact that people are dying and people are just being killed uh, because of water scarcity or water pollution, uh, regardless that other people are just living normally. You couldn't just understand it. We live in the same planet. We have the same rights. Yes, we, I know that geograph geographically we are different. Everyone have its own uh, continent, uh, its own country. And yeah, that's climate change. It, it hits especially the vulnerable communities who have never like contributed in neither emissions or neither pollution. And uh, this is where we talk about climate justice. So I started learning about all of these things. And I said, I said, no, this could be could not be right. I think few changes need to be made, radical changes, radical changes need to be made in terms to, I don't know, to put a justice, to put a balance for, for humans. So uh, so and the big like thing that happened to me when I started uh, I, I started learning I started studying climate change and environmental sciences in college and I knew everything like not everything for sure I know a lot of details of a lot of things about climate change and the impacts of climate change on us on the animals on the nature on the ecosystems on the microorganisms and on especially the future generations and I said no this is cannot be right I like I know I'm not I'm not we're not responsible neither for emissions neither for killing the animals, neither for uh, this uh, imbalance that is happening to our, to our planet, but I believe I'm responsible for not doing anything. So I said, this is the time for me to take the lead and this is time for me to speak, to, to speak and to try to change a few things, to try to raise awareness. Uh, I don't know about Midzi, but for countries like Libya and Tunisia, climate change and the environment, unfortunately, they are not a priority. So I said, let, let me let me look look behind a bit like i don't know like look to martin luther king Nelson mandela these people gandhi these people just like i don't know the the very present like trying to raise the voice and then I'm, I'm here i'm like with the people let me just speak let me try to convince them and everything started started that way and i'll be telling more of details in, in the next questions and uh i would like to continue right now with, with mitzi and I would like to know, like, what do you see as the strengths and success of your activist work? Like, what are what have you achieved, and what the things that you see as success in terms of activism? I always have a difficulty answering this because I know what people count as success is not necessarily like the same things that I count as success. So, um, the the correct and not really correct, but the the society answer, I guess, is how like um, we've helped lead uh, international campaigns against banks. Um, an example is Standard Chartered Bank, who finances a lot of fossil fuels in countries like the Philippines and um, a lot of countries in uh, South and Southeast Asia and a little bit in Africa. And they've changed their policies after like a year of campaigning, and it's still not enough, but it's good change in policy. Um, and all those things like that, where it's like, oh, we were able to do this and to do that, and we were able to go to this conference and to bring this many people to this, the COP26, et cetera. But for me, my successes are when I am able to talk to someone and I learned that they were inspired um, or they started becoming an activist because of um, the work that I've done or because they saw that there was another Global South activist, another person of color who was also an activist, and that kind of gave them the confidence to also start their work. I think that is the most fulfilling thing that I've ever experienced. I remember um, 
there was one time that I was very real and very honest about my climate anxiety on social media. And then someone replied and they said that they had the same thing and they asked what they could do. And I said, you should, this is a person who isn't from my country. And I, they, I told them to join the movement and, or, or start one if there isn't one yet. And I asked for their country and I connected them to someone in the movement in that country. And then we stopped talking, lost touch. And about a year later, she texted me and she was saying that I'm still part of the movement. My climate anxiety is so much better. And it's that those are the things that really, I think are the most important moments because it's those human connections. It's as Ahmed mentioned earlier, it's that humanity being shared among us that is, I think, so crucial and so important when being an activist. I don't, for me, more than all the you know interviews, the protests, everything, the most important thing is the human connections that are built and the solidarity that we're building together. And I think that is how you really change the system that we have because the system that we have that's so profit oriented makes us think that we're very individual beings that we are not connected to the environment that we are not connected to biodiversity that we are not connected to each other so the one of the biggest forms of protest to that and resistance to that is to have that collective nature to have that communal that community that sense of community among us and i think that's like my favorite successes i guess i just this is just amazing thank you thank you for doing all of these amazing things that you're doing and just know that even like the smallest successes are like incredible for sure like you're doing an amazing job helping people to understand more and more about climate crisis and as you said you help someone to to overpass the climate anxiety and you never know the the impact of this on the person so thank you very much i would like to remind the our the people with us that are watching that please do ask any question you like uh we'd, we'd love to answer your questions later we have like until 16 45 to uh to 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 continue our dialogue and after that we'll be happy to answer your questions so go ahead and uh, write to whoever you want in the chat so nisa tell me what about you what are the greatest successes that you achieved in libya like Tell me, tell me more about them. Although I know in Libya, it's, it's really hard to be an activist. It's really one of the hardest countries, especially after the revolution and with the uh, political instability. It's a really close country of mine. And I know what they are, uh, they are like living there, what they are suffering. So just being an activist in Libya, it's not easy at all. It's not easy at all. I really appreciate what you're doing. So I would like to know about the strength, especially the motivation and the success of your, your, your activism work and uh, your activist work in, in Libya. Go ahead, you have the, the, the space. Thank you so much, Ahmed. Like you said, it is really difficult. We always have security concerns. Whenever you want to put together an activity or do something, there's always like um, risk. Uh, but I will get to that later. For now, I will talk about the success um, like Mitzi said, success differs from one person to another. Some people would see it like if you didn't like reach, I don't know, global fame and become the next Greta Thunberg, maybe you're not really a successful uh, activist as much as you say that you do. Like, oh, and I also get things like, oh, really, I've never heard of you before. And like, but I see people writing about you in the media. How so? So if you're actually making change wouldn't people would like know who you are and more people would know who you are. So a lot of people associate success with fame. Uh, and honestly, at some point I started thinking that too, but I don't believe that anymore because from like my moment of realization that I succeeded, well, not because I received Princess Diana award, but because of how I received it. So in order to receive the Princess Diana Award, you need to be nominated by someone who was influenced by you or who was benefited by something that you've offered. So reading the letters of the people who nominated me and why they nominated me, that's when I realized that I, I have done something that I can consider successful. Because I started my activism at 2017 and I didn't have any funding and I didn't have a big team and I didn't have anything really. I would just reach out to training centers and schools and I would tell them, hey, I want to teach group X or group Y about this and that. And I started teaching people about sustainable development goals. 
And the reason why I wanted to do it is because there was literally no other organization was talking about it. Why aren't you talking about it? Why aren't you talking about climate change? It's a serious issue. issue. At least one person should be talking about this. And because there was no one, so I volunteered and I started doing it. And the kids would say stuff like, when I grow up, I would like to join your team. Or like, when I grow up, I want to be like you. And that gave me the motivation to sort of branch out and take on larger projects. But there was a point because of the security issues and feeling like I'm attacked or like I'm putting myself at risk and receiving some hate comments that made me think, I don't really see the change. I'm not seeing people you know, moving towards renewable energy. I'm not seeing factories to wor working on recycling or I I'm not really seeing any outcome of the work that I do. I'm talking, I'm going here, I'm going there, I'm on TV, I'm everywhere, I'm advocating, but I'm not really truly seeing change in the community. So maybe I'm failing as an activist. Sometimes you even start thinking maybe I should stop. And sometimes you have this imposter syndrome. I don't know if any of you ever had that before because I struggle with we, that. We do, we do all, we do all have that. that. Yeah, but like the Lisa, imposter syndrome. Lisa, let's 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 keep this part to the next question. Where you will be talking about the obstacles because it's the obstacles, really important, it, but, really but important. But for point. me, the imposter syndrome is not really the uh, like the obstacle for the work, but it's like how I create my own obstacles before I even take on on any project. Exactly, exactly. Like, as you said, being an activist in Libya, and I know what does that mean. I have a few, few friends from Libya, like, like Mohammed, Mohammed Shikhi is, is, a, is a close friend and he's doing a lot of great work. I'd like to say hi to him. And I would like really, really to congrat congratulate you guys for what you're doing there. And especially in these uh, hard conditions. So Mitzi, let's, let's go to you right now and like, tell me, uh, yeah, sorry, you already told us, let's see, so let me, let me just share my, my experience, I would like to share it with my, with the, with the movement that I'm a part of, I'm the general secretary of a movement called Youth for Climate Tunisia, and they're like, I love this movement, I love this movement, it's, I believe, the first youth-led movement about climate change, Our, the, it was created and co-founded by two uh, high schoolers, Rima Rahmani and Mohamed Jawedi, they were 16, I believe, at that time, uh, or even 15 uh, for, for, uh, for Muhammad. So uh, they are both from Qairawan, which is uh, an internal region, a rural region where they are suffering a lot from the impacts of climate change. Last year, Qairawan like, uh, recorded the highest uh, record of temperature. It was number one in, in temperature on, all over the world with 50 degrees Celsius. And uh, they are suffering from water scarcity, suffering from desertification, suffering from high temperatures, uh, so yeah, this idea came to their minds and they said, why not? Let's start Youth for Climate Tunisia. So they started Youth for Climate Tunisia and after, and uh, they said, let's do striking. And there was no strikes about environmental climate change in Tunisia. And they were a bit crazy and said, let's do, let's go in the street, let's go in the capital and let's start striking. The first strike was really successful don't ask me but i don't know how like a lot we have a lot of environmental as associations and organizations and a lot of them came there and they were concerned about climate change and a lot of activists and we all were there and just you know screaming there is no planet b stop climate change climate justice what do you want climate justice we really want it now for sure we were speaking tunisian but it was really amazing and after that we had like i don't know till now five strikes it was all the capital of Tunis in front of, so near to the Ministry of, of Interior. And uh, all, all, all the people could see us and the media, for sure, they are always present. They write articles about us. We have like, we go on television, on radio. And yeah, it was really amazing starting with Youth for Climate Tunisia. I joined them after maybe, I don't know, a few months. And the journey started with them and then it was really amazing. So uh one of our let's say greatest achievements is that we are raising awareness especially for the Tunisian youth after every strike a lot of youth came and join us we started nearly on facebook with 
100 likes maybe received like after two strikes let's say 2k right now after just just let's say one two years of work we are we have 12k on facebook and we have inside our uh, hardcore team let's say the youth for climate team we were like eight or seven in the, at the beginning and now we're like more nearly a hundred so uh i'm really i'm really happy with that we started working with a lot of organizations and once 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 upon time we have collaborated with greenpeace mena and we said there's something missing in tunisia which is climate education or environmental education like how could you would you like imagine that the next generation would fight and would like uh, advocate for climate change and find solutions if they don't know what is climate change. How would they know about it if they are not studying about it, about the impacts, about the nature of climate change, about the solutions, what the people doing, the best practices, how, what will be the impacts of climate change in 2030, 2050. So we said, let's, we did, we did a strike about it. And after that, uh, Greenpeace linked us to a famous Arabic actress, so famous. She's Tunisian. She called Hint Sabri, I believe Nessa know it. Hint Sabri, the Tunisian actress. She's so famous in the Arab world. Uh, and we did the one minute video. And at the, at the last thing, at the last, last seconds, Hint Sabri said, we need environmental education in Tunisia. And the video went viral. The video went viral. I don't know, it reached over 3 million viewers on Facebook and on Instagram, on Twitter and whatever. And, and after just like a few weeks, there is an association that was working on climate education in Tunisia. They signed uh, an agreement with the Ministry of Education to integrate environmental education into the Tunisian curriculum. That means just in one year, maybe two years maximum, children in Tunisia will be studying about climate change. And right now inside the movement, we're working on uh, we're working on the declaration of climate emergency. We have already demanded the president to do that, to declare climate emergency. Declaring climate emergency means that the government and the president uh, like say, needs to say that climate change is happening in Tunisia and we need to take all the responsibility and take all the measures and take concrete actions to fight and stop climate change in Tunisia. So this is like in a nutshell what we are doing inside the movement and, and yeah uh so let me let me let me as i said guys thank you as i said please if you have any questions just write us in the chat or the in the in the qr we have already i'm already receiving some some questions we'll be happy to answer them so let me go back to 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 nisa i want to know right now about the obstacles and i know in libya you'll be facing a lot you've just talked a bit about them i want to know more what obstacles do you encounter regarding your activist work in your country what are the problems the challenges it's not easy being an activist in Libya. It's not easy to convince the leaders or to convince even the youth in such conditions to, to, to advocate for climate change and to be active. So I want to know about the, 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 the obstacles. You have the floor. So in terms of obstacles, uh, they do change over time. So the obstacles that I used to have in the beginning uh, of my activism are very different from the ones that I have now. So at first, it was more about how can I get funding, for example, to take on large projects? How do I get people to become more interested in this and listen to me? How do I get the attention of the media so I can talk about this? That was the beginning. I, right now, it's all about security concerns. Uh, media is becoming more supportive of young people such as myself. And during the time when I got in touch with several media outlets. Now I made some connections. So it's easier, for example, to, to get in touch with them if I want to talk about topic A or B. But there's always the security concerns and then there's always the government support. So we have a serious issue when it comes to leadership. So when we're talking about the Ministry of the Environment, the minister himself doesn't have the proper background. He studied com something completely different, and I have no idea under what terms he was chosen to become the Minister of Environment. And then you have like the president. As you know, during COP, you need to give a pledge. So the pledge was given that there will be some uh, tree planting campaigns. It was a very, very small campaign. They barely discussed like an actual long-term plan. Some pictures were taken, and then that was it and it's been almost a year now. So 
the leadership is not taking climate seriously. So we can say that they don't have this top to bottom approach. We only have bottom to top approach for leaders like me uh, in, in the small community trying to do something. But we're being oppressed by militias and stuff like that. So for example, when I had my first strike, I would say it was successful to some extent, but definitely not as successful as the one that you guys had in Tunisia. There was a lot of questions raised. There was a lot of people who were very curious in the wrong ways, of course. Uh, I, I was almost attacked that day. So luckily, like my friend had to run to the fastest, like as fast as they can, so they can get some help. And then we received some protection from like the cop, like uh, the police station that was nearby so we could actually finish our strike until the very end. And then we had a strike that was much smaller a few months later, but that, that was it. We haven't been able to uh, actually put together another proper strike ever since. So I always feel like the security issue is hindering my work. I feel like I want to do much more. I want to reach out to officials. Officials are not taking me seriously even when it's done through other officials, because, you know, COP was, um, uh, was in the UK last year, so most ambassadors of the United Kingdom were doing their best to help the young people in the community to promote for the COP. And accordingly, the ambassador here did the same. However, when she asked the officials to get in touch with us, they said, yes, we will, but they never did. So my biggest struggles right now, how can I be taken seriously? How can I actually make it to the higher ups and have them listen to me? Uh, I have all these documents laying, uh, laying around in my room that I worked so hard on preparing things like proposals to how we can integrate climate education into the education system here in Libya, but I've never been successful. Like I couldn't actually you know, make it to the, um, to the ministry and actually hand it to them. And of course, security, because I always feel at risk. And I don't mind putting myself at risk, but I cannot put other people at risk and invite them to a place where they might get hurt. So that's why I can't, you know, uh, put together strikes freely and do other activities. That's, that's a major problem, let's, let's say, to be honest, in Tunisia. Like, it's, it's a bit different, but I could build on your words and answer this question or saying, the problem is the political will in Tunisia and the governance as well. Like we're doing strikes, we're addressing for sure who we want to address. We want to address the people, the youth and the normal people to understand more. This is our main goal to, understand, to let the people understand more about climate changes, uh, climate change and everything and the impacts of climate change and that the, it's a right for them to live in a clean environment and to live in a sustainable world and to live uh, like to, to, to have the right for their children to live in a sustainable future as well. So uh, for us, like with normal people, when we do strikes, they come and ask us what, we are, what you are doing. And we say, we try to explain this climate change. This is what's happening. And this is what's happening. This is what's happening. And sometimes I do remember this. This It was in our second strike, like I was explaining to, an, let's say, an old woman about climate change and everything. And I said, due to the lack of precipitation, and she said, Go talk to God. God have the power of precipitation. And you know, just like this, sometimes people don't understand you. And the other thing that just breaks my heart that no one from the government has like, even we did strike on social justice, climate justice, environmental education, and, and the last two strikes were about water scarcity and declaring, we demanded the president of Tunisia to declare a climate emergency. And we have received no answer, unfortunately. And this is just I don't know, sometimes as, as Nissa said that, sometimes I say, why I'm doing this? And there's no any, like, I don't know, response from any political partner or any political, sorry, any political like uh, figure or, or whatever. And, and I say, I need to continue doing this. I need to continue doing this because the first time they will ignore me, the second time they will do, the third, the fourth, the 15th time, maybe they'll answer. Maybe there will be like a communication between me and them. And this is a bit happened with, the focal point, the national focal point of Tunisia. Uh, I was like, uh, I have made a contribution to this in this year of Tunisia, which is the national determined contribution. And the focal point was there and we were, I was having a strike next day. Inside the session, the focal point of the UNFCCC, the United Nations Conference on Climate Change stopped and said, uh, hey guys, hey folks, Ahmed have something to tell you. Uh, tomorrow uh, uh, his movement is organizing a strike and go ahead, Dahma, take the mic and invite them all. It's about declaring climate emergency. And I felt so happy that day and I felt that hope exists. Like 
let me continue doing this with my movement. Let's let's like put more pressure. Let's 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 keep on. There is also always like problems with findings for sure. We want to do great things. We want to do like big things. Problems with findings and the problem with that we are just students. We're studying. We don't have enough time. And yeah, yeah. But we'll, we're just getting there bit by bit, step by step. Midzi, the floor is yours. For me, I think it's not that far off where it's the same where when we were starting, there was not a lot of climate awareness. Um, so I think we started, I started the Cup in 2019, which was around the same time that youth global movements around the world started popping up. And we were debating, like, do we want to use the word, the term Fridays for Future? But they were like, no one knows who that is, um, like outside of like, climate world um, now people do know more or less but then back then it's like we need a name that has youth climate and the, you know like it has to have the 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 words in it because it's so important to name what we're fighting for um so it it even in even the decision of what name we would pick it was it was about that also there was not a lot of awareness about climate change or if there was it was very much like climate change, anything about the environment. It's like, which it's true, they're all connected, but there is a difference also. Um, like for example, especially when we were starting out and we were climate activists, a lot of times, sometimes we would be invited to give speeches on or to do panels about house gardening. And I was like, I do, I love the environment, but that's very far from climate activism. Like. I mean, I love plants and I do house gardening, but it's not necessarily like that connected to my advocacy. I mean, it is, but like it's a few steps away, right? Um, so, and I feel like you guys are smiling because maybe you've experienced this too. Um, so <laughs> it was those types of challenges where people didn't really understand what climate was. So it was a lot about getting that translated into lay term, but also when translating into our own language, it didn't make sense. Like, even if you translate climate change into Filipino, it's not a term that people associate it with or recognize. And then there's also the similar with you guys, um, the dangers of activism here in the Philippines where our government, it's very different, I think, the way it's dangerous for you guys and for us. But for us, it's our government um, often tags activists as terrorists. And um, it's usually our community partners, so the fisher folk, the farmers, um, the indigenous peoples, the young indigenous peoples, especially in indigenous schools that are tagged as terrorists. Just a few days ago, actually, um, those groups, also scientists for the people, they had a their websites have been taken down because they are supposedly terrorist websites. Um, so it's this direct silencing of people's organizations and people's movements, and we've been able to kind of maneuver our way around that because it's also a global movement. So they have like, oh, we're legal because we're part of this global movement. And we work a lot with the UN and UNICEF, et cetera. But then um, there are times when the police are uh, knocking on our doors or looking for us, or sometimes it's, uh, a lot of times it's the trolls of, of the government like um, attacking us on social media. And it's those kinds of challenges. So it's. I feel like this is actually something that's happening more and more in a lot of countries across the globe where climate activism is being targeted. And um, it's not just happening in the Philippines, but I've seen it happen to a lot of countries also that there are new laws coming up to silence activism. And I think it's a sign of governments being so afraid of the movement and, and not just governments, but the fossil fuel industries that are supporting them. Um, so yeah. It's, it's difficult, but I think uh, something that's so important to remember is that we are doing it together. I think uh, Ahmed was saying also, it's, I love my movement so much because there is so much strength in being with that movement. Definitely. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's, Go it's ahead, very Nisa. interesting, and I've seen, I've seen Calspiracy, and something was mentioned regarding uh, some, you know, FBI and what's not actually uh, putting climate activists on top of lists of people who are wanted and, you know, labeling them with being terrorists and stuff. And I, I, am, I have never heard that it's the same thing actually in some Asian countries. So I'm very concerned how the word terrorist being used so loosely 
when you're literally trying to save the planet and the people who are actually doing terrorizing and horrifying actions are being protected by the system. It's, it's really scary. I'm terrorized right now. As you said, unfortunately, we're terrorists in front of their eyes because we're trying to save the planet and just trying to destroy it. They have like a different definition of, of ours. But if they consider us terrorists trying to 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 save the the to save the world, to save this planet, and to guarantee a better future for the for the uh, for the I don't know for the future generations or for the future of this planet, well then. I'm proud to be environmental and climate terrorist. So, so we came to our last question and I do guys would like to welcome uh, your question. So let's like take guys, Mitzi and Nis and me, let's like try to take two minutes, two minutes, two minutes to answer this one. So the last question and let me start answering it is about like, uh, how do we see uh, that the young people in, in our country, the numbers rising up, are they concerned and involved with the climate awareness and does this give, give, give hope like to us? The one thing that I'm still holding on is hope for me, definitely. Like uh, we've been talking about the challenges, we've been talking a lot, all of these things. The one thing that still like fascinates me and it's hope, like I'm really hopeful. I know one day we'll be like, we'll be getting there. We'll be saving the planet. Everyone will get united united and responsible and committed leaders will we'll just find solutions. It was like the coronavirus. It was, I don't know, like everyone thought it was the end of the world and everything, it will take us years to come back and see after two years, everything is, is normal, I guess. Well, climate change is the same thing. We need the technology, we need people to be aware of it. And yeah, I believe if you we want to do it, we will do it. And with especially the youth and the new generation that I'm seeing them really, really hopeful. And let me give you the example of Tunisia. As I told you, we started like with, I don't know, 1K maybe on our page of Facebook, it was just one person that turned into 1K after maybe six months or something. And now we have 12K. A lot of people are following us, listening to us. And after every strike, new people comes and wants to join the movement and he wants to speak and he wants to defend their right for a better world better world and i've met i've like traveled the world and i met a lot of youth and they just inspires me like from all around the world the latins europe uh, asia uh, africa uh, australia like just people um, i don't know i see them and i see the commitment i see the patience i see and I see the suffering that they're living, the struggle, the challenges, and how they are still continuing the amazing work, trying to convince the, the leaders, trying to to uh, to raise awareness. I'm just I cannot be, be I cannot be not like uh, I just can can be hopeful and just be can be op optimistic, you know, because we are the Generation Z. That's why they call us Generation Z because we are able to change things and we must change things. It is our destiny, it is our duty to do that. And I'll give the word now to, to Medzi after that to, to Nisa. Um, it's the same thing for me. That's where I get a lot of my hope from that community and from knowing that if you look at every historical moment in history, young people have been there, the, that generation of young people have been there leading the way alongside the most marginalized sectors of society, changing the world. And that, that's what makes the generation of youth revolutionary every single time, because we have that energy, because we will not compromise on our lives. And I think that our generation, this climate revolution is the latest wave of revolutions. And that together, as you said, we can change the world. I think there's so many of us fighting for the same thing, like literally, I think there's someone on every single country at this point fighting for climate justice. And I think that is such a powerful thing to remember that we are not alone in this. And with so many of us, we can't lose. Definitely we can't, definitely. As you said, there are many of us and we'll be like, they have the money, they have the power, they have whatever they have, but we have the, we have the faith and we have, the, we have humanity that, that keeps us united. Nisa, to you. Well, in my case, uh, it's a little bit different because this is going to sound very weird for everyone. But in Libya, the support that I usually get, I don't get it from youth, not necessarily. I get it from people kind of middle-aged 
because most young people my age and younger because they've lived for so long in conflict their mental status doesn't allow them to be as hopeful as i wish they could be and when they think about like things they want to change in their lives unfortunately climate is never a priority and that's why i have to always put more effort into media work than on field because i have to spread awareness and explain to people why it's important and only then when enough people have finally got the idea i can actually start be doing more action on the ground but what gives me hope is being part of an international network like this conversation that we're having right now is even though sometimes it feel i feel so isolated working in libya on the ground on my own and not having enough people my age around me caring about the same thing but at least i received the support from people such as ahmed for example who are like in nearby countries i have another ahmed who's a climate activist in egypt uh, a friend of mine who is a ceo of a really well known project called banlastic so it's these people that give me a lot of of hope and drive when i feel like kind of slowing down here in in my country thank you so much nisa thank you for telling the truth and i i really know what you guys are I just cannot blame the youth in Libya for myself. I cannot blame them because I know like since the revolution, what happened, like the whole country was like turned 180 degrees, like Libya was in a saw and in another, in another level now it's in another level and people live with conflicts. There is guns now in the street. People can could use guns and everything and the mental health and the education as well have, have, it, have it, this impact. So hopefully one day we'll see Libya as it was and better than it was. And with people like you, with youth like you, I'm, I'm really hopeful and I'm, I trust you and I trust the, the whole generation that will, will be making the change, definitely. So uh, now for the questions, uh, and guys, please, we have like eight minutes, you could uh, add, add, add more questions. We have these questions, I don't know um, whether if you, Mitzi or Nisa could, could, uh, could, uh, could uh, answer it. Like, how has your faith helped you or impacted you in any way, your activism and your climate? Talking about the faith here, let's say. Who wants to answer it? Let me repeat the question. How has your faith helped you or impacted you in, in any way, your activism in climate? I believe we answered this question, but we could build on faith. Who wants to, to go for it? I can go ahead. Um, go ahead. No one's speaking. Um, for me, I think it's very connected because my faith is very tied to my activism because my faith is in that it's almost as if my faith is in the fact that we will win and that people will win and, and that the revolution will win and so that's why it's very connected with me I have such a deep faith and love really for the people and the planet and life and that's where a lot of my activism is stemming from Thank you, Mitzi. It's the same here. Like, uh, some I always say, like, don't ask me how we're gonna like pass and win this climate war, this climate crisis. But I'm sure that we will do it. Nisa, I believe that you had something to say. Go ahead. Oh no, <laughs> I feel like I've uh, I've taken a lot of time to discuss this question at the very beginning. I feel like it's not fair to take more time, you know, to talk about the same. But I yeah. can answer the second question. Yeah, you. okay. The second question is from Amy Pakula. She said, how would you advise government to tolerate activism because activism kind of bring to light things to uh, things the country fails to do for its citizens? Okay, uh, this is a very interesting question because it kind of answers itself in some cases and some states because activism brings to light the things that the country fails to do that is why a lot of governments want to oppress activists because activists are the living proof that the state or the government is failing now there has been a lot of initiatives trying to bridge this gap or like have activists and young people work collaboratively with uh, the older decision decision makers but 
they are the ones who are usually taken because they seem to have this very traditional mindset that absolutely disables them from taking us seriously. So when they finally, finally gave up, the best they could do is just use young leaders such as myself to kind of like uh, make their image better. We're just there as photo props, honestly. And even at high level events such as COP and, and, and you know, pre-COP and other conferences, all, sometimes I just feel like a photo uh, prop, honestly. I'm just there to make them look better, never actually to present or represent youth or actually uh, have an opinion. We've been discussing this on like the types of badges that are given uh, during the COP. I was discussing this just yesterday with uh, Mohammed al Sheikhi, actually. And honestly, I don't want to be at COP if I'm just going to be given a badge to walk around at some specific room. If I'm not allowed to be there at the table and to actually voice my concerns, then it's not success to take a bunch of young like delegation just to be present there. This is really, really important what you've said because I've been, uh, I've been a climate negotiator with the Tunisian delegation since COP26. And I've had some really good training, uh, thanks to the to the GIZ and thanks to the Ministry of Environment of Tunisia. Like to be honest, they did one thing. As I told you, the focal point of Tunisia is a really good man who who really trusts the youth. Uh, so he like uh, picked with the for sure with like some characteristics. He picked a, a bunch of youth. We created this group of young negotiators, and we were there as negotiators. Everyone has its own thematic, and we were present at COP26 and at SB56 right now. I was, I was just there. And to be honest, if the governments have the courage to give, to give like youth the space to, exp to, to express and being, being able to present and uh, being present and enter the real negotiations, I believe things could be changed because I've seen like a lot of troubles. I've seen a lot of problems inside the negotiations room and how countries are, and groups are blocking the negotiations. And I believe with with uh, with like people like me and you, with experts, with youth experts who just believe that negotiations is a place to solve problems, not to create new ones. I believe we can make it. And I really hear, I'm, I'm here to send a message to all the leaders and the, all the governments, please let the youth inside the negotiations room, trust them. So we have another question, maybe Mitz. So the next question is from Annie. What, uh, what are some effective ways to achieve the success of eco-justice? I know we are, uh, we are trying to raise awareness of the younger generation by including climate change material in science class, having speakers coming to school to give lectures, et cetera. But based on my experience, I don't think those are useful at all. My friends are still wasting paper, turning on lights, even when they are not on their rooms. What can we like student do to do to inspire other and be influential. I think it's important to understand that it is going to take a long process because, you know, my best friends of ten years, they're the least climate aware people I know. Even though I'm me, because I feel like the more that people know you and the closer they are to you, sometimes the easier it is to ignore you, uh, which is sad. But it's it's something that happens. I think. Uh, so it is going to be a very long process and it's about that constant bringing the convert bringing the topic to the table and always talking about it and when they when they see that you care about it and that's something that really really matters to you i think that is something that's one of the most important ways and um to get them on board it's also making sure to connect them with like show them content that there's so much content on climate right now on Instagram that is really, really helpful because honestly, if I was just fed with the climate science in class, I wouldn't care either because it's boring, it's technical, it has nothing, it barely has stuff about the impact, about the justice aspect, about the people who are being impacted and how those people are fighting back. So it's so important to connect um, your classmates with people who are already being impacted by the climate crisis and than hearing about how these people are fighting back. I think conversations like this one is one of, are, are more powerful than um, a climate science class would do for someone who has never seen the climate crisis because then you hear from real people, you hear from people who are experiencing it and who are fighting back and people who are also their age and who are young. I feel like if I saw someone who was younger doing the same thing, I would also feel more empowered to do it. 
perfect answer actually let's see like let's find new new like better ways to learn better ways to to to, to influence and better ways to to talk so the last question if Alison could still have one minute or let's give you another minute yeah thank you so, so I'll, I'll be answering this i'll be answering this because it's really an amazing discussion with with nisa and mitzi and the the audience like a group said a group harris said can you speak to what kinds of global north global south collaboration you must welcome actually uh, i was speaking on myself and believe the guys have the same uh, view on this question would like to welcome any good collaboration especially like from associations and organizations that is really working for the case because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm witnessing we're witnessing a lot of youth washing would want we don't want to be used wouldn't want to be used as a picture uh, or, or as i don't know as any material okay we're working with youth they are working on climate change we're helping them no we want a collaboration that will benefit like create uh, benefits for both the global south and the global north the global north especially they could make pressure to the governments to, to convince the governments to to lower emissions and to give funds for countries like uh for for developing countries and least developing countries uh so yeah any any good let's say and any clean and any and any like uh any any proper collaboration is welcome for sure we, we do anything we would like to collaborate between the global north and the global south there's unfortunately a bit of a gap not between the youth maybe but between all the generations would like to, to to welcome any 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 good cooperation for sure oh and may i add something to that also, we, we are very dependent on the youth in the global north to advocate very well for us, because although a lot of states in the global north claim that they're already limiting a lot of their not so climate friendly activities, but they do continue doing so much more in their former colonies, fracking and what's not. So it's kind of hypocritical, because this is something that I've noticed as a North African, and it's quite an issue that needs to be discussed much more because we are already being left behind. So this is this is a serious issue that needs more time to discuss, but we don't have the time, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ahmed and Nisa and Mitzi. That's been, this has been a fantastic discussion. I'm really, really impressed with all of you. <clears throat> and um, my takeaway here is Gen Z means let's make change. So it's this has just been really fantastic. And our next program, which is called Wake Up America Climate Youth Activism in North America, uh, that's going to be on July 14th. And it's from 10 to 11. And I hope everyone on this call will join us for that discussion. Because I think, uh, Nisa, what you just said is so important that we really have to help each other <clears throat> and that these young, activists here in North America need to hear that from you and, and they need because they I think everyone feels that this is a really tough situation tough to get through to governments and, and officials and, and anyone that's involved in the fossil fuel world. It's just tough. And, um, and it's it's all about money, which is something Ahmed said before. And I think that you know, we have to really keep our eye on where we're going and why we're doing what we're doing. So thank you all. This has just been really, really wonderful. And it's it's great to meet you and we will continue to help promote what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us and it was a really an amazing conversation. Thanks so much, guys.